I've been doing application security for, uh, it says 20 plus, so almost 26 years at this point. Uh, and I've filed more than 30 patents, mostly around static analysis, dynamic analysis, web application firewalls. And I'm a, an active contributor uh, to some organizations like OASP, uh, the Web App Security Consortium, CSA, NIST, SANS, uh, and MITRE um, as well. So uh, today we have uh, what I think is a fun topic. Uh, so we're going to talk about API security and how to, uh, um, I guess, more effectively approach uh, API security. And uh, if you've been around the industry, the cybersecurity industry, uh, you know, uh, as many years uh, as I've done, as I've been. Uh, you've probably seen uh, one or more, or actually many presentations, cybersecurity presentations that always start with a scary slide. So here's the one, uh, the scary slide for API security. I think at this point, if if you're attending this talk, uh, you're already aware that APIs are becoming uh, the de facto uh, attack vector for many application layer attacks, for many attackers. Um, you know, it's it's no surprise, and we'll talk about why this is uh, the case, but 83% uh, of all web traffic today is attributed to API calls. We're seeing 600% increase uh, in attacks uh, abusing APIs, and that's only in 2021. Uh, I can promise you that uh, this has uh, been going on uh, and, and uh, with, you know, um, high growth. Uh, there have been multiple... Uh, key, you know, pro high-profile uh, API-related breaches in uh, in recent history. Uh, you know, just Google it; you can find all of them. Uh, no need to go through them. So let's try to figure out why it is, or what makes APIs so attractive to attackers. Uh, why are APIs so lucrative? Uh, so you know, if if you're again as old as I am. Uh, and you remember the 90s, how we used to build, or the beginning of the, you know, the early uh, 2000s, how we used to build uh, applications or web applications. We had a monolith application uh, where all the app logic was hosted on the web servers and application servers. You might have had a database uh, and everything was very well defined inside the perimeter uh, in your data center. It was very easy to secure. You place a, uh, a firewall. Uh, if you're protecting a web application, you would place a web app firewall in front of it. And that's pretty much it. Everything was very well defined and very easy uh, to protect. Uh, you put everything inside a garden, a walled garden, uh, and, and you have control over uh, your servers. Uh, but things have changed, uh, and they changed dramatically in the past five years uh, where uh, organizations are adopting uh, cloud-native technologies. And that means... Uh, you know, uh, if we try to uh, to describe what cloud native means, it means many different things for different people. But in general, uh, the business logic is broken and distributed. We're no longer talking about a um, a monolith application. We're talking about microservice uh, architecture, uh, usually using containers. Oftentimes, uh, we use public cloud uh, services like buckets and databases and message queues. Um, and, and uh, host the DNS services, and the perimeter uh, becomes um, um, less uh, less defined or less clear uh, where things cross boundaries or what are the boundaries of the application, whether the application is, you know, sometimes the application is hosted partially in your uh, private cloud or your private data center, and then parts of it are in the cloud, uh, and it spans in the cloud across multiple regions, and availability zones and different locations. Uh, and it becomes very blurry uh, or the, the, the perimeter itself is very blurry. Uh, and we also make a lot of use of APIs to communicate between the different components. Uh, so your code is using uh, APIs to communicate with public cloud services. Between microservices, there are API calls. In, in essence, API is like the new uh, networking, uh, if you will. Uh, yes, it runs on TCP or UDP, but APIs is the way uh, uh, with which the, the components of our application uh, communicate with each other. And with this change, it's obvious that application security now requires a different kind of architectural design. 
Uh, the architecture choice where you place a WAF in front of the application is no longer relevant when we are uh, when we are dealing with cloud native applications. Uh, and let's see a little bit of you know some of the differences that makes things more challenging. Um, first of all, when you take and this is a sample um, of a shopping an e-commerce application that is cloud native. Uh, and is publicly available. I think any kind of application today looks pretty much like this or even worse. Uh, you have many, many different containers or uh, microservices, each of them exposing APIs. They communicate over certain ports <clears throat> internally within, uh, within the cluster. Uh, and then you have the web front end um, or the, the north-south traffic uh, going to the front end. And for each... HTTP request done by a client to the front end, this usually translates to dozens uh, or more uh, internal API calls that, uh, that go between the different microservices. And so, um, you know, just looking at this specific architecture, it's obvious that the attack surface uh, dramatically uh, expands, and we, we will talk about that uh, more in a minute. Um, Let's take a moment to talk about the differences between uh, protecting the standard web interfaces and uh, web APIs. And I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about uh, our means to protect against automated scanning tools or attacking tools or exploit uh, tools used by attackers. Uh, as you probably know, the majority of attacks against APIs and against web applications are not manual. Uh, maybe the initial reconnaissance will be done manual, but at the point where you find the SQL injection, when you find uh, a ball of vulnerability, you'll start automating uh, the attack process using automated tools. And the way to prevent automated tools from accessing our standard web applications are, are pretty clear. Uh, we start by fingerprinting the client, getting all sorts of uh, signals from the client to detect whether we're looking at a browser, at a human, uh, or is it a bot that, or you know, an automated tool that's trying to attack. We usually extract uh, using JavaScript code that we inject into the web responses. Uh, we gauge all sorts of fingerprints, like the browser screen size, whether the mouse is moving, uh, whether we see any kind of human features uh, in, in the interaction. Uh, and so I already mentioned, we inject challenges. We tried to get JavaScript code to execute within the browser environment and to answer some kind of challenge, or maybe we can raise a CAPTCHA if we're uncertain, a CAPTCHA challenge, whether it's a human or not. We can also apply rate controls. So it's obvious that if somebody's accessing my login, uh, that someone, that client shouldn't be sending a thousand login requests per second. Doesn't make any sense. It's very easy to apply rate controls to the standard web uh, interface. And we can also use the same JavaScript challenges to, to do some proof of work, to check whether the browser is running JavaScript, is accepting cookies, is uh, respecting session tokens, and so forth. Uh, and the proof of work is usually done or placed in order to make sure that it's not uh, financially um, uh, financially uh, beneficial for the attacker to, um, you know, to operate a bot in front of the application. Now, when it comes to APIs, things are quite different. Uh, so with APIs, we can't really do any kind of fingerprinting because APIs were created for machine-to-machine -machine interaction. APIs were not uh, created for uh, the web browser in most cases. Yes, there are APIs, uh, you know, to fetch uh, back data from the backend by the browser, but the majority of APIs that we're talking about are probably B2B or some kind of client to, uh, to the application. And so fingerprinting is usually uh, not an option in that case. Uh, the same applies for challenges. There's no point in raising a CAPTCHA for an API uh, call uh, because there's no uh, human looking at the API request, it's done automatically by a machine to a machine. And so if you put a capture, you're just going to break the API. Again, not in all cases, but in many of the cases uh, that we're looking at right now. Uh, rate controls, again, APIs were created to be consumed by machines. In many cases, you want to allow 
API consumer to send large amounts of uh, API requests for uh, getting different data. Uh, if, you, if the API is doing um, uh, paging, then you, you, know, you expect the client to send multiple requests very quickly. And so rate controls are, again, not a good option. And then there are two bonus, um, you know, I'm not sure if bonus is the right word here, but two bonus problems uh, that are added to APIs. One is sloppy version management, and I'm, I'm going to cover both uh, items. And the second one is that the API specs are usually, or not usually, but in many cases published online because we want to allow uh, external or third-party developers uh, to understand the API, the format of the messages, and to interact with the application. So let's talk about these two uh, bonus uh, factors. Uh, the first one is sloppy API version management. I'm pretty sure that if you're here uh, listening uh, you know, to talk about API security, you've heard the, the term uh, zombie APIs. Uh, that basically means APIs that were discontinued or abandoned and are, are no longer maintained or supported. Um, that is actually an attribute um, that we see more and more or, or a scenario that we see more and more in modern applications and in modern CICD pipeline-based applications uh, where developers push code uh, multiple times a day, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, multiple times a week and sometimes multiple times per day. Uh, and it's hard to keep track of different APIs and API versions that we have um, uh, that we've published, uh, and so we see um, a lot of zombie APIs being left behind, and those can be obviously accessed by attackers. Uh, the second, um, you know, sloppy AVI, API version management issue is shadow uh, or our shadow APIs, so undocumented endpoints. Sometimes developer leave behind all sorts of exposed APIs for debugging purposes, and these shouldn't um, uh, be accessed by you know, external users. And the last one is old versions. I mentioned that. We all know the, you know, the API format, uh, the RESTful API URL format, where you have the V1, V2, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's pretty common to leave legacy uh, APIs to support legacy clients. Uh, you don't want to break uh, functionality, and so you leave old versions, and uh, these old versions might contain vulnerabilities or auth authorization problems, authentication problems. With regards to specification, I already mentioned that uh, if you want people to, you know, to access your APIs, to use your data, to, you know, you're exposing an ecosystem and you rely on third parties, you have to document your APIs. In many cases, we offer this documentation as API specifications, either on the web or an open API spec file or Swagger for, for those who remember Swagger. Um, and so we publish these spec files and these spec files, um, you know, support legitimate developers, but they also support uh, attackers. Um, essentially, they are giving attackers a way to learn what are the different API endpoints, what are the parameters they're expecting, what kind of message formats, uh, and so forth. That's very easy um, when you, you know, if you compare that to standard web attacks where you have to, to do a lot of guesswork here, we're essentially giving you away the documentation of how the ap application works and what it expects. Uh, and if you're using GraphQL, there's an interesting feature in GraphQL called introspection. Uh, it's sort of uh, API documentation on steroids. It allows you to um, run a request uh, against the GraphQL endpoint to introspect uh, the endpoint. You get a list of all the different actions and queries that you can run against the GraphQL, including the format and so forth. Uh, again, very useful if you're an external third-party developer that needs to understand what you're uh, dealing with uh, and how you integrate with the API, but uh, also very easy for an attacker to, to, to do um, you know, all sorts of reconnaissance on the application. Um, so let's see how how are sneakers related to API security, and that's an interesting story. Um, you know, a few years back, I was working uh, for I guess the world's largest CDN company, Akamai, and we were um, we were building a solution for bot risk management, and we noticed that uh, the sneaker industry really suffers from automated bots doing purchases. I'm not sure how many of you are sneaker fans. 
but but from time to time, companies like Nike and Adidas uh, and so forth, they they uh, put out new new shoes. Some of them are limited edition, and uh, they publish that on Twitter. And within a few minutes, uh, there's really no chance for us humans to um, get a hold of uh, those shoes. You you simply can't buy them. Somebody automatically ran a bot. Uh, apparently. There is a whole market for what's called sneaker bots. Uh, so automated bots that target APIs directly uh, buy all those limited edition shoes very quickly uh, and really leave no chance for us, uh, you know, the human buyers uh, to get a hold of those shoes. And that's across many, many different industries, not just the sneaker industry, you know, scalping tickets, shows, etc. cetera. Um, so, because these tools require some kind of a, a, a configuration to know which APIs they should be targeting automatically very quickly to buy the shoes, to buy the tickets, um, there is now a marketplace in the dark web and in many of the forums uh, for uh, bots that target APIs and, and they sell these templates. Uh, you can see a few examples. Sentry MBA is a very popular uh, bot that targets APIs. And you can see a few uh, of these, um, you know, configurations that you can buy or download that automatically target APIs. You don't have to do any kind of reconnaissance yourself. You just download or, or buy these configurations. You point the bot to the API and it starts hammering until it buys all the shoes. Um, uh, that's uh, an interesting angle uh, to API security as well. So at this point, you know, uh, many people think, okay, API security, we've heard about that. We have a web app firewall in place. We use an API gateway for that. Are we still um, uh, at risk? Uh, so let's see at, you know, some of the limitations related to these traditional, um, you know, security uh, controls. Uh, so usually the way you would deploy a web app firewall, and we talked about it early on, uh, is you would put the WAF at the perimeter, uh, inspecting every inbound traffic or north-south traffic, uh, if that's how you uh, prefer to refer to that. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, the Web App Firewall only monitors incoming or inbound traffic coming to the front end. It does not inspect any kind of east-west uh, traffic. It doesn't have any visibility to traffic between the APIs, and it doesn't monitor any other type of entry points that is not uh, through the front end. If you're asking yourself what kind of other entry points I might have, so you might have um, again, if you've broken your application into, into microservices, you can use these components, <clears throat> pardon me, to have, for example, serverless functions interact directly with some of the um, microservices. You might have data getting loaded or stored um, in a storage bucket that is then loaded to a microservice. So the web front end is not necessarily always your only entry point to application uh, business logic. Uh, and here's a real world scenario of an application that uh, I, I saw a, few, a couple of years ago. Um, in this scenario, uh, you have a workload running in a container in, a, in the public cloud in a Kubernetes cluster. And, and the way the application would work, it, it's an application that uh, does file processing. Uh, the user would interact with a web uh, form that allows file upload. The file is upload to, uploaded uh, to a storage bucket. Then the client actually sends a subsequent API request with the location of the file stored in the bucket through an API call to the workload. The workload then uh, wakes up, pulls the file from the storage bucket, does the processing, uh, and so forth. So... Um, how was this application uh, uh, breached? So the way it worked is uh, the attacker would upload a malicious file or a file containing uh, some malware that would explode within the, uh, the workload. Uh, so think about malware being stored in the storage bucket. The attacker would then send the API call with the file location uh, to the malware stored in the bucket. Uh, the workload will fetch the file execute it, uh, detonate, uh, the vulnerability will get exploited. Uh, there's a remote command execution in the workload. Uh, the remote command execution is then used to steal secrets from the workload, essentially abusing the IAM role permissions assigned to the workload. Uh, 
uh, take over the cloud account and leak data outbound. Uh, so there are multiple layers that, uh, that have uh, risks or problems or um, uh, you know, potential vulnerabilities or business logic flaws here. And if you would try to place a web app firewall just in front of uh, the web front and the, uh, the web form, uh, that wouldn't really solve the problem in this case because it might inspect the file upload, but it really can't do that in real time to inspect malware inside the file during a, a request to upload. Uh, that won't work. Uh, you might uh, have the web app firewall inspect, uh, you know, in front of the API gateway, inspect the request, but essentially the API request is benign. It's just a file location. So there's really nothing uh, that looks malicious or that looks a bit off uh, in the, um, you know, in the way that things uh, evolved in this attack. And, and so it's pretty easy that a standard web app firewall placed in front of the web uh, interface is not going to, uh, to cut it. Um, with regards to API gateways, uh, these are awesome tools, uh, but the focus is not really on security. Uh, API gateways are an operational tool. Uh, they offer very rudimentary security. Um, you know, the main use cases would be to support developers as a developer portal for the APIs, to apply API quota, uh, traffic transformation, some of them might do some kind of uh, request validation, uh, but, but that's as much, you know, as far as they go with regards to API security. Um, and on top of that, and that, that is actually more relevant to cloud native applications, not all of the APIs in your application are, are actually accessed through the API gateway itself. Uh, you have all the Kubernetes APIs, you have backend APIs, you have... Uh, APIs uh, going back and forth to, to cloud services, uh, these usually don't go through the API gateway, and so they are not even inspected. So now that I hopefully got your attention on, you know, the problems with APIs and how to, you know, you know what it means to, uh, to secure APIs and what are the different aspects of APIs and the limitations and drawbacks of existing solutions, let's talk a little bit about best practices for API security. Uh, or else uh, you're not really getting anything out of this talk. Um, so, you know, trying to talk about, uh, you know, in general, the topic of API risk management, I see three main pillars related uh, to how you do API risk management. Uh, the first is discovery. You need to discover the APIs or else you have no visibility to what you need to protect, what's going on, what's, you know, what is protected, what's not protected, uh, where are you getting attacked, um, and so forth. Uh, and that is usually the first layer. The second layer is getting more context around the APIs and what they do and where they run and what are they running on, and then doing the risk profiling itself. So risk management for API really hinges on these three um, topics or three pillars, discovery, context, and risk profiling. And let's quickly talk about all three of them. Um, you know, if you look at API point solutions, and I'll get back to that topic in a minute, um, the majority of them concentrate on the discovery of APIs, the profiling of APIs. So looking at uh, endpoint paths, host names, the methods being used, you know, get, put, uh, delete, et cetera, uh, the method structure, query parameters, client types, when was the API last used, and the hits. Uh, and that is very standard uh, common practice for every API security point solution. That's what they, they are based on. They look at the traffic, they profile the traffic, they apply security on the traffic. But that's the only layer that API security uh, protection tools uh, use, uh, but they're completely missing the context. And the context is, is, is super important when you try to assess uh, the risk. And the context for an API is not just the API itself. Uh, the API is just a conduit to the application. It's, it's, it's an entry point to the application, but this entry point uh, is exposed on a workload. The workload is usually running on an operating system, uh, the workload has labels, it has a cluster if it's Kubernetes, it's running on an image or a, a container image or a VM image. Uh, there is the orchestrator running um, that workload. The workload has namespaces. The workload uses 
third party open source packages, all of these present the context that when you look at the overall risk to the API is very important. Uh, if you monitor the API and the API is running on a workload that is vulnerable and full of holes, that has an effect on the risk. The risk to the API, and that's important to remember, is not only at the API layer, it's on, uh, it's related uh, to all of the layers underneath the API uh, that are accessible. And the third part is the risk profiling. And risk profiling is done in many different ways for APIs, whether the API is internet exposed, publicly exposed, is it using and you know, passing sensitive data or PII? Uh, is it authenticated or is it, is it you know, publicly open to anyone? Uh, is the API code using vulnerable packages? Um, are there vulnerabilities in the underlying operating system of, of the workload? Have we seen attacks on this API before or not? Uh, and have we applied virtual patches uh, to, you know, to the code or to the application or to the API? So all of these are the pillars related to API security. And how do you prevent attacks to APIs? And so from a best practices perspective, uh, you need to apply positive to, uh, security as, you know, essentially uh, enforcing the API specification uh, for each API endpoint. Um, and you can do that automatically. You can do that manually, depending on the tool of your choice. Uh, you need to inspect any kind of request and not only um, north, south, or you know, inbound traffic, but also API or workload to workload uh, payloads. You have to inspect them for malicious, uh, you know, attacks or signatures. Uh, you need to block unauthorized automated API calls. Uh, you need to apply strict access controls. Usually, uh, you know, uh, you can do that based on IPs, geolocations, HTTP headers, API keys. We're, we are talking about APIs and API keys are, are critical, uh, you know, JOT tokens and, and so forth. You can apply uh, rate controls, but you have to do that carefully. As I mentioned, many APIs are um, meant to be consumed by machines that work rather quickly. Uh, and if possible, try to place attackers in penalty boxes. So once you detect an attacker, instead of letting or um, you know blocking the attacker on a per transaction basis, you can put the attacker in a penalty box for five minutes, 10 minutes, and that would be very frustrating for the attacker uh, going forward. If they were in the middle of a reconnaissance uh, phase, uh, that's going to block them. And of course, remediate any kind of misconfigurations in your API definitions. You can do API, um, open API spec configuration, file scanning. Uh, there are uh, many tools, one of you know, a couple of which I can already point out from Palo Alto Networks that check off um, uh, from our um, uh, cloud application security module uh, and Prisma Cloud Compute also offers that uh, capability. But there are open source tools to scan your API definitions as well. So an important point, and I already touched upon that uh, multiple times in previous slides, um, API security point solutions, and we've seen a lot of those uh, showing up in the uh, you know last uh, couple of years. There are uh, large vendors offering API security specific tools. Uh, the problem with this is uh, with these tools are, is that they address only the tip of the iceberg, and I've already you know touched upon that multiple times. Uh, they look at the web front end, they look uh, they look at north south traffic. Some of them might also inspect east west API traffic or microservice to microservice, but they are completely oblivious to anything beyond that or under that. Uh, they don't look at the workload. They don't protect the workload against the attack. They don't do any kind of security posture management for your public cloud infrastructure. And as I mentioned, these are all different layers that are essentially exposing your or, or serving the API that you're exposing and serving your application. Your application is built on top of many, many different layers, the public cloud services, the IAM roles, the workload, uh, you know, the cluster, the or orchestrator, uh, Etc. So you can't really be oblivious to all the other layers when you do when you when you think about API security and when you think about application security in general. And of course, uh, code security, scanning your code, scanning for secrets. We've heard about recent, uh, you know, uh, huge uh, data leaks uh, uh, because of uh, secrets getting 
uh, exposed in GitHub repositories, um, uh, software composition analysis, scanning your IIC code templates. Um, a point about ineffectiveness of uh, using point-specific solutions, I'm not only talking about API-specific uh, solutions uh, in general. The way we or many organizations approach application security, sorry, or API security is with multiple tools. Uh, we've seen organizations, and I think the standard enterprise has anywhere between 30 to 60 different cybersecurity tools. When we're looking at application security, you know, there are at least five, maybe 10 different tools that are being used. The AppSec team usually would run a tool that scans API specifications, secure API, uh, observes API traffic, tries to analyze live traffic uh, and prevent attacks. Uh, we have the developer usually running SAST or SCA scanning for vulnerabilities in the code. And we have the cloud security team uh, running cloud workload protection tools, uh, finding issues, vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, and malicious events uh, happening in, in cloud workloads. Essentially, these three teams are working on the same application, uh, getting three different views or angles of the same problem. Uh, and it becomes a problem to actually triage an issue. What happens when your application security team finds an issue in an API, and then the same issue is being flagged uh, uh, you know, for the developer as a vulnerability, but you can't really connect the dots and you certainly can't connect the dots uh, to runtime events as well. So uh, trying to triage issues uh, for APIs or for applications uh, is becoming an issue when you are using multiple different tools. So what is the holistic approach to uh, API security? Um, I don't know how many of you are using a cloud native application protection platform or a CNAP, but the way we at Palo Alto Networks and in, specifically in Prisma Cloud approach things is through a multi-layered approach that is unified and that allows us to uh, give our customers a way to secure the entire life cycle uh, from code to cloud, or as you can see here, you know, from the code and build to the deployment and to the runtime. And that is being done through multiple um, security points that, uh, or security uh, components that um, help you throughout this journey. Uh, so a cloud native application protection platform for those of you who were, you know, who don't um, uh, haven't experienced it or don't know about that is a platform that provides end to end from code to cloud security or app cloud native application security uh, for cloud native applications. And it provides it through multiple different modules or capabilities uh, that help different teams and different user personas uh, starting on the left, uh, during the code and the build through SEA, static analysis, software composition analysis, finding vulnerabilities in open source packages, secret scanning uh, to make sure that you're not leaking secrets in your code, in your repositories, doing infrastructures, code security scanning, and supply chain security, making sure that your CICD pipelines are secure and have the right permissions uh, attached to them and the, you're not allowing any third party access to your you know, crown jewels. And then during the deployment, um, 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 we're looking at vulnerability scanning. Again, once you build container images, uh, usually your container images are based on um, uh, base images, and these base images might introduce vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. So it's important to scan not only your code, but also the artifacts themselves and, uh, you know, run the container inside a sandbox and make sure that uh, it doesn't contain any kind of malware. And then as you go to the run uh, or, you know, to the cloud area or, uh, you know, to the real time when the application is deployed, cloud workload protection, cloud security posture management, identity and access management security, making sure that all of your roles are least privileged and that your containers or your the API that are exposed on the containers are not using overly permissive IAM roles. And then a web app and API security module that inspects API traffic and applies security. And of course, data security to prevent leak uh, leakage. And 
And so, you know, if you look at the standard way of doing API security, every API security tool will give you this kind of screen, the API discovery. I talked about that. Uh, essentially, monitoring API traffic, giving you uh, complete visibility on all of your API endpoints, what kind of HTTP methods they're exposing, whether they are protected or not, etc. But using the unified approach, uh, and you see this in Prisma Cloud here, uh, we also uh, factor in other attributes. Uh, you know, if you remember the triangle that I talked about earlier, that uh, that are relevant to to doing API risk profiling. Uh, and so, the three uh, <clears throat> easiest things that you probably heard about, you know, from other API security tools, you can uh, check whether. Uh, your API endpoint is exposing or you know, sending or receiving sensitive data like PII or credit cards, whether or not the API endpoints requires authentication or not, and whether or not it's reachable uh, from the internet. And on, on top of that, we actually factor in uh, the risks from the workload, like I mentioned earlier. So the workload is underneath the API, the workload is exposing the API, uh, so whether the workload has critical or high severity vulnerabilities or CVEs, uh, what, are, what is the attack complexity of those CVEs, uh, is the attack vector over the network, um, whether it's a remote command execution vulnerability, whether it, it has a fix and you haven't fixed it, and more importantly, uh, whether the vulnerable packages are actually in use. And this is very unique to Prisma Cloud since uh, our agents are cloud workload protection agents um, see the workload themselves and can monitor the memory and can know whether the sensitive vulnerable package uh, is actually in use by your application, uh, hence reducing you know, a lot of the noise associated with SCA tools uh, that simply tell you that you have a vulnerable package, but you don't really know whether it's in use or not. Uh, once you have all of these risks factored in, um, the tool will allow you or the platform will allow you to apply API protection. So real-time API pre attack prevention, uh, prevent parameter violations, uh, prevent shadow APIs from getting accessed, um, and any kind of unspecified query parameters like debug flags. And more interesting, um, the fact because we know that you have certain vulnerable packages and these packages are in use, in that specific workload, uh, our customers can choose whether they want to apply virtual patches for those specific vulnerable packages um, uh, automatically. So in this case, you see the famous or the infamous uh, log for, uh, Log4j, Log4Shell vulnerability. Uh, naturally, you don't want to apply virtual patch on any workload, especially if that workload is not using Java and is not using Log4Shell. Uh, and so, in our case, in, Prisma, in, the, in the case of Prisma Cloud, uh, the intelligence and the, the risk factors that we extracted from the workload allowed us to know that Log4j is being used. It's loaded into memory. Hence, the uh, virtual patch will be applied automatically for that specific workload, preventing false positives in, in other places. Uh, so, you know, just to summarize... Um, you know, the different angles of API security related or, or you know, provided by Prisma Cloud. Uh, we're talking about API discovery, automatically discover APIs, API risk profiling, including all of the underlying layers doing this more holistically uh, based, you know, on what we discussed earlier, uh, provides real-time protection against, you know, the OS top 10 and so forth, uh, and does everything with a single platform, a single holistic platform, um, you know, reducing um, uh, the need for many, many different point solutions. Um, that's it. Okay, so uh, I see one question, and the question is, uh, what is the best uh, way or mechanism to identify zombie APIs? Um, so as I mentioned, I think the first step for Every API secu security uh, activity you're doing is the discovery part, and discovery can be done. Discovery can be done either through 
uh, looking at the open API specifications, I don't expect to see zombie APIs appearing in there. And so the next best approach would be uh, to monitor traffic to the APIs. Uh, so monitoring traffic, profiling traffic, uh, profiling uh, you know which APIs are exposed but are not getting any traffic and that should sort of uh, raise a red flag whether they should stay exposed or whether uh, you can remove them. You can you know, look uh, once every 90 days to see if the last 90 days uh, th that API didn't get any kind of traffic, then you can probably remove that or 180 days depending on, on your um, organization. Uh, I hope that answers that. Um, second question, my API requires authentication and only authorized clients can access them. Uh, is there less risk of a breach? Uh, so honestly, no, um, uh, they are susceptible to breaches. Uh, as I mentioned, the majority of uh, APIs that we expose today, unless they are for, you know, for the front end, uh, use some kind of authentication. You need some kind of API key or not the majority of, or many of APIs require an API key. That doesn't block the attacker from um, impersonating somehow, getting a fake identity, getting an API key, accessing the application like a, a legitimate user and then abusing uh, the business logic. Um, uh, so really authentication is is not a means to security. It's just uh, you making sure that you know who's in front of you, but that's pretty much it. Um, uh, there is no kind of signing on that identity. Uh, the majority of interesting web attacks and API attacks I've seen required authentication anyway. So um, um, authentication is not uh, the way you secure APIs. It, it's an important, uh, it's, it's an important uh, factor, of course. Um, Ravi is asking, how do we secure the PII information transfer through APIs that encryption uh, alone suffice? Um, so, yeah, you need to make sure that, um, you know, sensitive data on the wire is encrypted with the latest and greatest, um, uh, you know, um, um, TLS uh, suites, TLS version or encryption. Um, you know, I've seen some organizations use Base64 as a means to sort of encrypt uh, traffic. That's not encryption. That's just, you know, uh, it takes two seconds to uh, decode Base64. Uh, so make sure you are um, securely um, encrypting uh, any kind of API traffic. Um, and in addition, you know, data at rest needs to be secured. Make sure that your databases are encrypted, uh, that the proper uh, roles and permissions are assigned to them, uh, and so forth. Are malicious payloads less of a concern when using communication uh, protocol at gRPC? Um, no, no. Uh, they are just as relevant, uh, and they are just uh, the same. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of how you format the message. There are ways, very easy ways to encode traffic. Uh, if you're using uh, proxies, you know, uh, to to uh, to halt traffic and manipulate it, uh, like um, um, uh, a Fiddler proxy or Burp proxy, uh, these have plugins to decrypt uh, gRPC. Uh, it's very easy to to abuse gRPC based or GraphQL based our um, uh, messages. And even if you use your own proprietary protocol, um, you know, you should assume that uh, somebody will be able to reverse engineer it. So um, yeah, that's not really a means uh, to security. Uh, so I mentioned agents or you mentioned agents at which layer of the OSI model are these agents operating? So the cloud workload protection agents are running uh, um, usually at the kernel uh, level inspecting, um, you know, behavior of containers on the node, uh, analyzing uh, behavior of the workloads of the application of the network. Um, so these agents are uh, hooked to the environment and understand the environment and can prevent any kind of attacks at the workload uh, and operating system layer. Next question, uh, should we keep API keys that end up residing in the browser script client side inside a secure parameter store or is it okay to have them in version control uh, like a Google map key? Um, 
So API keys that uh, that are in the client, you should assume that they are <laughs> publicly available. Um, uh, you know, if, uh, I think the classic case of uh, mobile applications that have some kind of token <clears throat> embedded uh, into the client, it's very easy to reverse engineer that. Um, you know, you can even put uh, some kind of proxy, intercept the traffic and use the API keys uh, later. So just assume these API keys are, are made public uh, and uh, they shouldn't be trusted. Don't base anything uh uh, you know, don't base any kind of security on that. It's it's good for identification, uh, but beyond that, um, um, there's really no point in in storing them in a secure uh, way. Uh, beyond that, uh, it's just publicly available anyway. Um, so you know, follow the best practices uh, of of the framework you're using to develop the application. Um, but assume that the API keys are, are available to anyone.